Hello, I hope you can all hear me. It's such a pleasure to be here today uh, virtually with you all. Uh, my name is Kristen Hope and I'm Global Advisor on um, Participation, Research and Advocacy for Tardism Foundation. Um, and it's a real pleasure for me to uh, support uh, this session because it is a subject that is really um, close to my heart, um, which is the topic of uh, participation and accountability in humanitarian action. Um, we're delighted to have with us today um, a very rich uh, group of uh, speakers um, spanning from the worlds of academia to uh, child protection practice to even speaking about um, the perspective from donors. Um, so it will be a very interesting conversation and, um, and we will have some interactive segments as well. So, um, so we really invite you to, um, to, to, as Julie said, be present with us, share your views, um, you know, interact through the chat function as well. We have some Mentimeters. I believe there's a Mentimeter that's also been shared already, um, which is also just the opening poll to let us, um, to let us know a bit more about, about where you are. Um, but uh, before I hand over to our first speaker, I'd just like to also, you know, set a little bit of the scene for this session. So the session, as you will all know, is called Child Participation as a Cornerstone of Accountability to Children practice examples in education, grant making, and self-protection. Um, and so, um, as you, as some of you will know, if you were attended the opening plenaries yesterday, um, one of the main topics uh, of this year's annual meeting is around accountability, which is actually one of the four priorities of the Alliance's strategy for the period 2021-2025. Um, and I wanted to just highlight the way in which accountability features in the Alliance strategy, um, which is that as a goal, it's, it's formulated as, as, as follows. All humanitarian programs are accountable to children and ensure their meaningful and equitable participation. This is the goal that the Alliance has set for itself in the current strategy. And really what's important about this is that it's also anchored within the broader idea of the centrality of protection, which was also um, the, the main overarching theme of um, this, this year's annual meeting. Um, and it's really this idea that says that it's actually the centrality of children and their protection in the humanitarian system entails that it is that children's protection is everyone's responsibility in the humanitarian system. It is not just the responsibility of child protection actors in our community. And so we really want to be leveraging our collective um, expertise and, um, and, and voices to be able to think about how all humanitarian actors across all of the sectors, the humanitarian sectors, can be more accountable to children. Because children are a third of the world's population, and in many humanitarian contexts, they are over 50% of, um, of children in that context, um, and we will hear more about that later on. So, um, so really just wanting to frame as well and to highlight the way in which the, the participation is seen, in, is framed in the Alliance strategy as a really core element of achieving accountability to children. So I just wanted to read a few sentences to you from the Alliance strategy, which is that the commitments to accountability of humanitarian actors are rooted in a rights-based approach that puts people first. Um, and in order to be truly affected to, accounted uh, to affected populations, we must be accountable to children. This begins with the equitable inclusion of all children across our commitments. Rights-based approaches must include child rights. They must be people-centered and they must be child-centered. The final phrase of the Alliance strategy, which I want to, to leave us with as we start this conversation is, quote, the participation revolution called for by the grand bargain cannot be achieved without having a child participation revolution. And so it is with those words that I would like to hand over to our first speaker, Rashi Mitra. Rashi is a child protection um, uh, and uh, she's a qualified social worker and she's an international child rights professional with experience in child protection. And she's going to speak to us about the work that she's done um, on the concept, on the, the topic of child protection, child participation for protection in humanitarian action. With that, I hand the floor to Rashi, over to you. Thank you so much, Christine, for handing over to me. Thank you to all the participants and audience present here today. Really welcome to all of you. I'm really glad to share my research on child participation for protection and humanitarian action today. Um, in a moment, we'll be sharing the slide as well. Great, lovely. Thank you so much. 
So before I begin my presentation, as we all shared, please be interactive. Let's learn together while we present our, our work today in this platform and let's, uh, let's learn from each other. So, so hello everyone, as Christine briefly introduced myself, I am Rashi, I am a child protection uh, professional worked in India and in the UK with victims of child sexual abuse and also with children in conflict with law. Also I've worked with child laborers in terms of their rescue and rehabilitation. My topic, this topic has been a motivation in terms of my work in, term, in the field of child-led advocacy and Federation of Children's Parliament and Child Participation Forums such as World Summit, et cetera, in India and, and in the UK at this point in time. Moving forward, I would firstly introduce you all to have a discussion here in terms of what my topic suggests to you. So if you can have a look at the Mentimeter that's being shared at this point in time, if you can please share what is the first thing that comes to your mind when you read the topic, child participation for protection in humanitarian action. We can see the Mentimeter results here as well. Wow, empowerment, accountability, underappreciated in its importance, radical shift, difficult, truly difficult, complex, asking, asking children in vulnerable situations what they need to feel safe. Yes, very, very right. Respect, a re right for every child, children taking lead, amazing. Challenging, children as key stakeholder in their protection, much more work needed, yes which is why we are all here together, converging our efforts. The need to ensure that children's perspective and voices are at the center of developing and implementing humanitarian response. Yes, empowerment, accountability to children, self-empowerment, lack of child-friendly protection materials. Thank you. Children's voices being heard, listened to, and their views considered. Thank you so much for your inputs on this. Yes, truly, this, these, this is what the topic is about, and this is what we are here to gather. To, together and discuss about. Thank you so much for these. Moving forward to my next Mentimeter question. What do you think the term child participation mean to you? What does child participation mean to you? Amazing, answers are popping up. It's empowerment. Empowering the children to advocate for their protection. Very correct, very true. Rights. Diversity, wow, I like that, thank you. Diversity and inclusion, it's their right to participate. Yes, unique perspectives. I can see results in the chat box as well, thank you. It means that they, that they, act, that they are actors of their own protection, yes, true. Being meaningfully engaged throughout an intervention, yes. Create active agents of change, children being actors of their decisions taken for them. Meaningful engagement of children in their protection. Brilliant, thank you so much for the insights. Moving on to our next question before we move on to the discussion. So what does child participation in humanitarian action mean to you? We spoke about what child participation means to you. Now specifically, what does child participation in the context of humanitarian action means to you? If you can please share it in the chat box as well as Mentimeter. Seeing them as full persons in their own right, yes. Amazing, thank you for the inputs that you have shared in terms of what child participation means to you. One more I can see involving children in both response and recovery phases of an emergency and humanitarian assistance. 
truly, that's completely true. When we are talking about child participation in humanitarian action, we are specifically talking about involving children in both response and recovery phases of emergency and every humanitarian assistance that we carry forward. Thank you so much for your brilliant insights and inputs. And thank you for participating in the Mentimeter. Moving forward, we will, act, we will now talk about what my research findings are and what are the way forward in terms of uh, invite, invitation to the future researchers. As we, all here, as we all who have gathered here must be already knowing that one in every four children resides in a country impacted by a humanitarian crisis. That stark is the statistics available that, that is that at the moment that one in every child is residing in a in a country where there is humanitarian crisis. This is from the report of our minimum standards for child protection and humanitarian action uh, report from 2019. And we all know that whenever there is any humanitarian crisis, such as floods, armed conflict, earthquake, or whether it's natural disaster or an armed conflict situation. Children are the most vulnerable and they're exposed to appalling circumstances where they face several losses such as family loss, eroded safety net, abuse, violence, neglect, etc. Which is why we are talking here about how participation can like participation for protection can be can be seen as a tool to enhance children's protection. How did I arrive at this topic? Firstly, the, in, the reason for the interest in my topic was in terms of my ch work of child-led advocacy and setting up of children's parliament and children's consultation in pan-India and now in the UK. Also, there is a theoretical assumption of existing intersectionality between children's right to protection and, and participation. We talk about how Article 12 of the UNCRC, which talks about right to participation, and Article 19 of the UNCRC, which talks about children's right to protection have an intersectionality in many theoretical researches, re researches and also in the general comments. However, my research has been motivated by the fact that there lacks empirical evidence in terms of how this intersectionality, intersectionality can be studied and established. This, which is why this research is, in contribu is a contribution towards that intersectionality. The research question for my research are, how child participation leads to self-child protection during a humanitarian crisis? The sub-questions are, why child participation leads to self-child protection? Secondly, how does creating safe space for child participation lead to enhanced protection in a humanitarian crisis. Moving forward in our, in our, moving forward in this discussion, we will be discussing about these research questions primarily. And, my, and the findings are also based on answering these research questions. Primarily, how child participation leads to self-child protection during a humanitarian crisis. The operational definitions used in this uh, research are humanitarian action, wherein I'm defining humanitarian action as any action taken during humanitarian crisis, both man-made or natural crisis to save lives, alleviate sufferings, maintain dignity during and post disasters and strengthen preparedness for future crisis is a humanitarian action. This definition has been used from the CPMS report page 2019. How am I defining child participation? The provision of opportunities for participation in meaningful social action that empowers the children to better protect themselves and participate in matters and decisions affecting them during humanitarian crisis is child participation. What is child protection? Child protection is the prevention of and response to abuse, neglect, exploitation, and violence against children. How am I defining self-child protection? The ability of children to protect themselves and hold duty bearers and stakeholders accountable is self-child protection. I would like to bring to notice of the, of the participants present here, when I am saying that child, child protection enhances Child, through child participation, and when I'm talking about self-child protection, I am nowhere talking. I'm nowhere suggesting that 
child protection is completely children's responsibility and adults should, should be absolved of it. I am talking about how enhancing children's participation can enhance their own protection and also empower them to hold duty bearers and stakeholders accountable for their, for their protection. Moving on, the methodology, method, the methodology that I have used in my research is a secondary research wherein I have used document analysis through case study approach. I have used secondary data and used published case studies by several INGOs who have their programmatic intervention in the humanitarian context. Further, to analyze the case studies, I have utilized the theoretical framework of UNICEF child protection strategy, and the CPMS child protection model. Based on, for the participation models, I have used UNICEF adolescent participation model and Lundy model of child, uh, model of child participation. I'll very quickly and briefly talk about the Lundy model of child participation, wherein we can see, as in this figure, we talk about four key elements for participation. One is space, voice, influence, and audience. When we talk about space, this model recognizes that it is important to provide space for children to participate. Secondly, there requires a voice wherein children are able to share their voices in a space, in a safe space that has been provided to them. Thirdly, there has to be an audience who would listen to the voices of the children, who would hear the, hear the opinions of children. Lastly, based on the space, voice, and audience, based on what children share through their participation, there has to be an influence and advocacy that, that takes place uh, based on after hearing the voices of voices of the children and views of the children. Moving ahead, this is the UNICEF conceptual framework for adolescent participation. As you can see from the Lundy's model, uh, the elements of the Lundy's model have also been incorporated here in terms of the elements of voice, space, audience, and influence. The same has been analyzed through the minimum standards for child protection in humanitarian action. As you all know that the presentation today, that the, uh, the annual alliance theme is centrality of children, the minimum standards for child protection clearly speaks about how child participation is a key element in the child protection. So this, this figure clearly talks about how child participation is interlinked to strengthening child protection systems, strengthening children's resilience and their safety. So discussing the case studies very briefly that I have incorporated, utilized in my research, I utilized three case studies. Firstly, the Sissi Amineta case from Sierra Leone, wherein I have, wherein it, I have discussed about how child participation for protection has been, has been utilized through children's club in Sierra Leone. My second case study focuses on refugee children's participation for protection in the Uganda refugee camp, wherein children access several child protection processes through the case management process and child protection systems in the refugee, refugee camps of Uganda. My case study three analyzes the relationship between child participation and child protection using the element of hope in a community-based child protection project implemented in the context of refugee settlements in Southern Lebanon. This, this has been utilized using the hope scale. So what does my research findings say based on the analysis of the case studies? As I shared about my all three cases, there were three, please note that there were three elements of participation that has been analyzed. One is through children's club. Secondly, through child protection processes available in the, uh, in the refugee camps. Thirdly, the community-based child protection responses that had been designed in the, in the humanitarian uh, humanitarian crisis situation. Based on the research findings, there was, what did I find? Firstly, the, through the case studies and the review of literature, I found that child participation for, protect, for, for protection in humanitarian action actually increases. What I mean by that is that 
whenever we focus on children's participation in the context of humanitarian action, the self-protection of children also increases. For example, in case study one, I, spoke, I uh, analyzed how children's club helps children to share their voices and also write letters to parents as well as stakeholders in terms of what are their needs, what they need, and what are their protection issues. This, was really, this is also really important in the context of cultural sensitivities, wherein children are not given the space or the chance to participate or speak openly. So do, with the case studies, I have seen that child participation for protection is increased in the context of humanitarian action. Also nature of children's participation. There have been several uh, instances wherein that, that the nature of children's participation is different. In some contexts, there has, uh, children say that what participation means to them is that sometimes they say that children's club is a means, means for participation to them. Secondly, they say that sometimes in case management process, being able to talk to their child protection worker is participation to them. Also, in, in cases of in cases of other uh, contexts, such as in case of hope scale, where there's community man community system of humanitarian action, children say that being able to help others in the context of humanitarian crisis is a mode of participation for them. So as you can see, there are, def there are several different typology of participation that, that, are, that do occur in the context of humanitarian action. Secondly, I've also found that what is the importance of having safe space for children's participation? The case studies suggest that children specify that, it, that it's really important for them to have a safe space to share their opinions, a safe space which is free from violence and fear. Secondly, they, they have also shared that there are several barriers to participation, such as, such as cultural and such as cultural barriers and also sensitivity around sexual uh, and uh, sexual uh, re reproduction, reproductive issues and sexual abuse as well. Thirdly, evaluation and monitoring of child participation for, protect participation for protection is lacking. Most of the studies that I have come across in terms of literature, as well as, uh, as, well as uh, participation programming models are self-referential. There hasn't been any, there hasn't been much of external evaluation studies that have been done in terms of how child participation is measured in the context of humanitarian action. Also, one thing is that whether we, whether we have seen that there is meaningful participation and inclusive participation or not. In, in the analysis of case studies, we have found that there, are, there is lack, sometimes there's lack of inclusivity in terms of participation, lack of diversity, wherein every child is given a chance. And also the, the research shows that there has been tokenistic participation and one of instances of participation with lack of sustainability in terms of creating a long-term participation model, a long-term scope and space for participation for all children. The participatory risk analysis clearly speaks that, there, that the analysis of the case studies show that there needs to be a proper risk analysis when we are including children in participation. That is, whether the children, whether we have done a proper risk assessment in terms of our safeguarding policies, whether the, it is safe for to create a child, uh, where it, whether it's safe to act, to have children, to create that safe space for children to share their voices, especially in the context of armed conflict or any other such conflict situation. Therefore, participatory risk analysis is a very important aspect that probably has been neglected in our programming or in terms of uh, creating uh, participation spaces. Moving on to challenges and risk of child participation. My research also suggests, the findings also suggest that there has been an unpredictable nature of human, we, we all know that there are, there are unpredictable nature of humanitarian emergencies. Because of the unpredictable nature of humanitarian emergencies, it is really important to be mindful of creating a safe space for children in terms of their participation. There are also ethical challenges and cultural sensitivities around child participation in the context of humanitarian, humanitarian crisis, because every society have their own cultural norms and ethical issues around children's participation. The level of funding gap in humanitarian action in human, is, is also a major barrier to creating child participation platform. Non-participation of children 
is often seen in light of the best interest of the child. This is something to reflect on that whether we as humanitarian actors, as child protection workers, do we see children as active change of, age, change of agents? Whether we see that if children are not, part, not given the right to participation, are they protected or whether, whether they lack protection in the absence of participation? My research says that non-participation of children is often seen in light of the best interest of the child. What are the recommendations for policy and practice? Some of the recommendations that I share are use children's agency and participation for sustainable re resilience. It's important that we include children's voices in terms of their sustainable resilience in order to enhance their protection in any humanitarian action that we carry. Please do not focus just on adolescent participation, but also focus on child participation as well. There are several program, program designing and models which focus on adolescent participation. However, the research shows that children of all ages can, be, can participate in, through verbal and both nonverbal cues. So I invite that child participation should be seen in totality and not just in case of adolescent participation. I also invite to think that we need a universal framework and definition for child participation, especially in the context of humanitarian action. Like I said through the case studies, everybody views child participation differently, whether it's organizations or whether it's academicians. For instance, during in my research itself, I've presented a different child participation definition, a different uh, participation, a child participation definition as opposed to other NGOs or other academicians. I invite to have a, to a need for a universal framework and definition for child participation. Thirdly, Develop empirical evidence and research for child participation for protection in humanitarian action. There lacks, there lacks, lacks a lot of empirical evidence, especially in the context of humanitarian action, about how child participation can enhance child protection. Therefore, it is important to conduct more research for child participation and protection in humanitarian action. There is also a need to shift from tokenism towards meaningful and inclusive participation. We, as humanitarian actors and child protection specialists and workers, need to reflect whether we are creating an inclusive and diverse participation space, wherein every child is given a sustainable chance to participate. And it is not just a one-off event wherein they just come and share their views, but a sustainable long-term space where they are given the chance to participate. Fourthly, increase funding towards sustainable interventions during humanitarian crisis. Rashi, so I'm just gonna mention it. We want, it's so fascinating, it'd be wonderful if you can wrap up in the next couple of minutes so we can move on. Thank you so much. Definitely, thank you. So what are the limitations in terms of, the in terms of my research? As I've highlighted, there's lack of empirical evidence and literature in the context of humanitarian, uh, humanitarian action, especially in case of the topic that I have currently proposed. Therefore, my, most of my research, as it is secondary data uh, based, most of my research is based on child participation in interdisciplinary aspects and not specifically in the humanitarian action aspect. Therefore, my research, all, therefore my research risks generalization and also invites other researchers to carry research on this particular topic and fill the research gap. It also raises pertinent questions about the role of child participation for protection in humanitarian crisis. It, in, it invites, my research is a starting point for exploration of this intersectionality in the humanitarian co context. As per my knowledge, this is a sole exploration of the intersectionality in terms of child participation and protection in the context of humanitarian crisis. Therefore, I really appeal and invite researchers and academicians to conduct research on this topic and fill the empirical gap that is currently existing. I think I would leave you with the key que some of the reflective questions, such as, do you think that child participation leads to self-protection in humanitarian crisis? Why do you think child participation leads to self-child protection, especially in the context of humanitarian crisis? 
how does creating space for child participation lead to enhanced protection in a humanitarian crisis? What is needed to enhance child participation during a humanitarian crisis? Some other questions of ref reflections that I would like to leave you with are who decides what is child participation? Who decides what is child participation in the humanitarian context? What is meaningful participation and what is not? Thank you so much, Rashi. I'm so sorry, you. but we have to wrap Thank up you. and pass on. So. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks to you, Rashi. It's fascinating to see this piece of work. And it's also wonderful to see in the participants also some supporters from, uh, from your university. So it's fantastic to have this, this academic perspective to kick us off. Um, and so um, now we will pass to our second uh, group of presenters who um, will be speaking to us about their experiences in putting some of these things into practice in their work in Burkina Faso. So it's... Um, it's my pleasure to welcome Julia Sirocco, Zoe Nabu Wedrago, and Sedu Pontraoré, who will be who are from Plan International. Um, our colleagues are putting their bios in the uh, in the chat box. Um, so we're really um, very pleased to have our colleagues uh, from Plan International Burkina Faso with us now. Um, just to inform you that the presentation so will be in French. So um, please, if you'd like to uh, listen in English, you can navigate to the bottom. Uh, there should be a little globe and you'll have the um, English translation. And um, also we will have an interactive segment as well. So we really encourage you, we'll have a couple of breakout rooms, just really quick to be really, you know, thinking together and hearing your voices. And, um, and then we'll be coming back together and, um, and concluding uh, then afterwards the final speakers. So over to Julia, Sedu and Zoe Nabu. Merci beaucoup. Bonjour à tous. Notre présentation aujourd'hui portera sur le projet FAST, un projet d'éducation qui est mis en œuvre au Burkina Faso et en particulier sur les activités qui sont couramment mises en place pour accroître la rédévabilité envers les enfants et favoriser leur protection dans l'environnement scolaire. La présentation est structurée en trois parties. Une première partie qui introduit le contexte et le projet et décrit les activités qu'on met justement en place pour faciliter cette participation de protection des enfants. Puis un court exercice, comme disait Kristen, à faire en groupe. Et enfin, on fera une réflexion tous ensemble sur les défis, les succès, les leçons apprises et bien sûr les questions. Il s'agit d'un projet toujours en cours et pour cela, cette session de réflexion commune est vraiment très importante pour nous et nous vous remercions déjà de votre présence et contribution. Et sans plus attendre, je passe la parole à mon collègue Feidou. Merci, Julia, et bonjour à tous. Merci pour l'attention. Euh, L'expérience que nous voulons partager avec vous se déroule au Burkina Faso, un pays situé au cœur de l'Afrique de l'Ouest, l'Afrique occidentale, et qui est frappé par une crise sécuritaire depuis 2015. Et cette crise sécuritaire a malheureusement des conséquences multidimensionnelles, avec notamment des mouvements de population. On a près de 2 millions de personnes déplacées internes actuellement la fermeture des structures éducatives, plus de 6 000 fermées à nos jours, l'exacerbation des violences basées sur le genre, et, 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 y compris en milieu scolaire, et aussi la détérioration des conditions socio-économiques des ménages et qui se traduit par l'insécurité alimentaire. Voilà, et le projet FAS se veut une contribution de de plan international et de ses partenaires à la réponse programmatique de cette crise sécuritaire. L'objectif général de ce projet, c'est d'améliorer les résultats d'apprentissage pour les filles et les adolescentes en âge de fréquenter l'école primaire et post-primaire dans les zones d'insécurité du Burkina Faso. Trois axes principalement, à savoir éliminer les obstacles liés à la demande éducative, garantir une offre éducative sûre et accessible aux filles et sensible aux gens, et aussi apporter un soutien aux, aux structures techniques et renforcer le système qui est mis en place pour, pour, pour 
appuyer cette offre éducative-là. Alors, de manière résumée, euh, il faut indiquer que le projet a une approche holistique en agissant sur, sur, sur plusieurs angles. Il y a des interventions au niveau des écoles primaires et des écoles franco-arabes. Il y a des interventions dans les centres d'apprentissage accélérés. Il y a une approche communautaire importante avec notamment des sensibilisations, la formation des leaders. Et c'est dans ce cas justement qu'intervient la mise en place des mécanismes de feedback et de plaintes. Il y a le plaidoyer qui est fait. Il y a aussi une approche, un regard transformateur des gens. Il faut noter que face à certains projets, gens transformateurs, et cette question est regardée avec attention aussi dans le cadre de ce projet. Alors, nous disons tantôt que les mécanismes de feedback ont été inclus au nombre des activités de ce projet et pourquoi les mécanismes de feedback et de plaintes dans les écoles. Au nombre des personnes déplacées internes figure un bon nombre d'enfants qui sont en situation de, de rupture scolaire qui ont été réinscrits dans les écoles, dans les, dans les, écoles et dans les localités d'accueil. Donc, parmi ces enfants, il y a des enfants qui ont vécu des traumatismes et il y en a qui vont peut-être en vivre au sein des écoles. Et donc, les mécanismes de feedback se veulent des mécanismes qui prennent en compte toutes ces dimensions pour pouvoir apporter des des réponses aux problématiques de protection des enfants. Et c est, c est, le processus de mise en place s'est fait en six étapes, principalement. D'abord, l'élaboration d'une note d'orientation interne pour euh, guider le processus, la consultation des parties prenantes, y compris les enfants, la sélection des canaux de communication adaptés, notamment les boîtes à suggestions, les groupes d'écoute et les feedbacks directs. Ensuite, l'identification et la formation des points focaux les points focaux étant les directeurs d'école. Chaque directeur d'école est d'office point focal du mécanisme de son école. Et ensuite, après l'étape de l'identification des points focaux, il y a eu la mise en place des comités de gestion des feedbacks et des plaintes, comités composés du directeur comme évoqué tantôt, puis d'une assistante, l'assistante géant au niveau de l'équipe du projet, et puis une volontrice communautaire de communication et VCC et une marraine. Ce sont des acteurs communautaires dont la contribution est jugée importante et pertinente pour la réussite du processus. La dernière étape a été la sensibilisation des élèves et du personnel scolaire à l'utilisation de ces différents canaux. Alors, donc, après le processus de mise en place, la question pertinente qu'on peut se poser c'est de savoir comment se fait le traitement des plaintes. Mais un focus sur les canaux que nous avons évoqués tantôt, il s'agit précisément des boîtes à suggestion, des groupes d'écoute et des feedbacks directs. Ces feedbacks directs-là, nous précisons qu'ils peuvent se faire auprès d'un membre du comité de feedback. Ça peut être le directeur, ça peut être la marraine, ça peut être la VCC ou bien euh, l'assistante Jean. Les enfants donc ont accès à ces différentes modalités avec la liberté d'exploiter le canal qui leur convient. Alors, comment sont traités euh, les feedbacks, les retours d'information des enfants? C'est un processus en cinq, cinq étapes principalement. La première étape, c'est la réception du feedback ou de la plainte. La deuxième étape, c'est l'examen de ces feedbacks et par le comité et où l'acteur, le membre du comité qui aura été saisi à titre individuel. Parce que ça, la possibilité, comme on l'a dit tantôt, est donnée aux enfants de pouvoir le faire. Et selon l'urgence, à cette étape, lorsqu'il s'agit d'un feedback direct, l'enfant peut être référé, par exemple, à une structure de protection pour pouvoir apporter une réponse efficace et rapide. La troisième étape concerne surtout les feedbacks pour lesquels la boîte à suggestion est utilisée et pour lesquels donc il n'y a pas d'urgence. Le comité statue, examine. Et la quatrième étape, c'est bien sûr, le comité examine et procède à une classification avant de passer à l'étape de l'analyse et de prise de décision concernant les différents feedbacks. 
Voilà. La cinquième étape consiste à suivre les actions qui auraient été décidées et suite aux décisions qui ont été prises par rapport aux différents feedbacks. Alors, donc voilà de manière résumée et comment le traitement des feedbacks et plaintes des enfants sont faits dans le cadre de ces mécanismes-là. C'est un processus qui implique vraiment la communauté qui tient compte également du genre. Merci, Julia, pour la parole. Merci à toi. Donc là, maintenant, nous allons essayer de faire un petit exercice pour s'activer un peu. Donc, vous voyez sur cette diapositive, vous pouvez voir cinq euh, commentaires et suggestions des enfants que nous avons reçus euh, par le bias de boîte. On n'a pas mis d'autres typologies pour des questions de sensibilité. Nous allons maintenant nous diviser en trois groupes. Il y aura un groupe francophone qui va travailler euh, en français avec Seydou et Zenabou et euh, ils seront dans une chambre. Après, il y aura un autre groupe qui sera animé par moi en anglais et aussi un groupe qui va rester en salle plénière qui sera animé par Kristen. Et euh, l'idée, c'est d'essayer de discuter un peu de ces commentaires, de voir, comme vous voyez, il y en a de plusieurs typologies. Il y a des dessins, il y a des écrits, il y a des commentaires qui ont été transcrits parce que les calligraphies n'étaient pas faciles. Donc, l'idée, c'est d'avoir quatre minutes pas beaucoup, je sais, mais le temps, il n'est pas, pas trop notre ami, pour discuter de ces commentaires et répondre à une question. Qu'est-ce que feriez-vous pour donner suite à ces feedbacks et quels défis vous voyez dans l'interprétation des messages et dans l'action que vous envisagez? Donc, on a quatre minutes et après, on reviendra en plein air. Et pour le bénéfice du temps, nous n'allons pas faire tout de suite une restitution des différents groupes, mais nous allons ouvrir un espace d'échange à la fin pour pouvoir capitaliser sur toutes les réflexions, donc garder all your burning questions, toutes les questions brûlantes. Et maintenant, on se partage dans les groupes, comme ça, on commence la, la discussion. Voilà. Donc. Thank you, Julia. So now we're going to be going into the breakout rooms, as Julia just said, for um, four minutes to really, you know, hear from you and put you in the situation to answer, to, to think about what it means to practice, you know, to put in practice this, these accountability mechanisms for children um, in these educational settings in Burkina Faso. So you should all be receiving, um, I'm looking to our producers, asking if the breakout rooms have been open. And if so, um, you should be receiving a, yes, I can see people moving into the breakout rooms. So please do press uh, the button, um, which invites you to into the breakout room. Uh, please join a room. There's a room in French, which I can see some people joining. And there's a room in English. And then the rest of you will be here with me. And we will continue to work in English with the French translation. So if you are a French speaker, please do um, stay in, um, in this room. But if I could ask the, um, the um, um, uh, producers to move to slide nine, actually, uh, on the, the Jamboard. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, on the Jamboard. Sorry about that. Um, sorry, slide eight. We're going to look together at slide eight on the Jamboard, um, and we're going to work on slide nine. So basically, here is the Jamboard. And basically, we, the question is, um, we want to, uh, to ask you, looking at these, these feedbacks that have been received, from children in the educational um, settings in Burkina Faso. Question is, what would you do to follow up on these feedbacks and communications? What challenges would you foresee? Challenges in interpreting the messages or challenges in taking action to address this feedback? So, Do we have someone from the project here? Because I'm, I think that's a helicopter and a gun, but I'm not entirely sure. Yes, it is. Okay. Great. Yeah, we did do this in the, um, in the, yeah. yeah. So it is, so that number one is a helicopter and a gun. That's, that was what was received mm -hmm. in the feedback box. Number three uh, is, a tran is, uh, is a written note in French. Why do we give rice to the girls and not to the boys? Boys want rice too. And number four, is the class teacher hits the pupils, the teacher insults me. So what would you do to follow up on this? 
the floor is open. You can unmute, you can put your comment in the directly in the Jamboard on slide. Uh, we're working together on actually the number eight, which you can see here. What would you do if you received this? Uh, can I say that something? Please. Yes, thank you. I think for some some feedbacks, I'm prosper, by the way. For for <clears throat> for some feedback like uh, this helicopter is really difficult to interpret, but you do not have to abandon, you need to follow maybe with the, the school or the center to know really what they want to mean. And uh, for the class teacher, for instance, you do know which class and which the, who is the, 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 the concerned teacher. So sometimes it's difficult to interpret the email, the, the, the feedback. So you need, of course, to follow and deeper forward to understand more. Thank you so much. I've taken note of that in the Jamboard. Um, and um, yes, so I've taken note that, yes, it, there's a need for follow-up and to really understand what's being meant. Thank you so much, Prosper. Anyone else? Anyone else want to share their reactions? Sure. Um, this is Heather. Uh, I find the comment about why do we give rice to the girls and not to the boys particularly challenging. Um, and it seems to be coming up in many places in that there are real needs uh, to have gender-based programs because of the different challenges that girls face. Um, but then if boys feel left out of that, it can cause uh, conflict and tension. And so I don't as much have an answer except for a need to bring um, gender transformative approaches into um, uh, programming, including child participation to help uh, build an understanding of the differential um, challenges that girls face in many communities. Thank you so much. That's so important. And we probably have time for one more um, feedback. Well, feel free to also put your feedback directly in the Jamboard as well, but maybe one more person we'll hear from in the, in the plenary. Does anyone else want to yeah. add their thoughts, please? Yeah, related to, to the last distribution to, to, to girls only, I think sometimes some feedback give us uh, information that we didn't explain our criteria, uh, I mean project criteria before, or why we did choose only girls. So it, it orient to project manager or project team, how it is important to explain and provide important information to all target group so that they can nobody can feel uh, discriminated. Because if you lead easily this message, it is like this one feel that as he's discriminated. So it is really important to give important criteria and information so that everybody feel considered in the project. Thank you. That's such an important point. I'm just adding it in the Jamboard. So thank you very much. Um, as you can see here, um, we have the, um, yes, we, um, others, I think everyone's come back from the main room now. So thank you all uh, for, for your activities. And I will pass back to our colleague, to Julia, uh, to and Zuenabu and Sedu to wrap us up in this session. But really I invite you, you, all of the participants to continue to put your ideas into this Jamboard. The Jamboard will stay open. So even though the time for discussion was short, please continue to share with us your ideas. Back over to our speakers. Hello. So we're back. I cannot see the slides. I don't know if it's me or if the slides are there. Wonderful. Uh, perfect. 
Alors, là maintenant, euh, merci à tous. Donc, comme on a dit et comme Christine a dit, merci de continuer à ajouter des inputs. C'est vraiment fondamental pour nous. C'est une session très riche. On a besoin de cette discussion, cet échange qui est très nourrissant. Là maintenant, je passe la parole à ma collègue Zenabu Ouedraogo qui va nous guider sur ce que nous, on a vu qui sont de des aspects positifs et aussi de, de challenges et des défis de notre mécanisme. Zenabou, à toi la parole. Merci, Lilia. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Là, maintenant, on va voir les principaux résultats positifs liés à la mise en place des mécanismes de plainte et de feedback adaptés aux enfants. Et il y a de nombreux avantages à mettre en place ces mécanismes adaptés aux enfants et parmi ces avantages, nous en avons retenu trois principaux. Et le premier est que les mécanismes de plainte et de feedback adaptés aux enfants constituent un moyen efficace pour améliorer la gouvernance dans les écoles. Et la raison pour laquelle on, on avance cette idée est que, et à travers ces mécanismes de plainte, on a une vue d'ensemble de la vie au niveau des différentes écoles. On voit les problématiques vécues on les identifie convenablement, on identifie aussi les bonnes pratiques qu'on peut encourager et on responsabilise mieux les différents acteurs pour apporter des réponses adéquates aux problématiques vécues par les enfants dans les écoles. Et grâce à ces mécanismes de plainte, on arrive à gérer de façon transparente tous les problèmes vécus par les enfants au sein des écoles, mais aussi dans les communautés et dans les familles. Le deuxième résultat positif qu'on peut observer est que, et à travers ces mécanismes, on arrive à rendre effectif le principe de participation des enfants. Le mécanisme de plainte et de feedback adapté aux enfants est mis en place suivant un processus et inclusif où tous les enfants ont la possibilité de participer et Durant tout le processus, toutes les différentes étapes, l'enfant est au centre de ces mécanismes de plainte et de feedback et de ce fait, ils arrivent à participer convenablement. Ces mécanismes de plainte aussi permettent aux enfants d'exprimer de, de manière libre, éclairée et sans préjudice tous les problèmes qu'ils vivent. Les enfants se sentent confiants de venir exprimer leurs problèmes à travers les mécanismes de plainte et de feedback dans les écoles. Et à travers ces mécanismes de plainte et de feedback, les enfants arrivent à développer des initiatives pour répondre aux problèmes, pour résoudre les problèmes qu'ils vivent au sein des écoles. Et à ce niveau, nous avons un exemple. Et suite à l'installation d'un abattoir juste à proximité de l'école, les enfants ont, se sentent mal à l'aise à travers les odeurs, à travers le fait de voir et, et régulièrement les animaux qu'on abat à proximité de l'école. Et on a décidé de réaliser un plaidoyer auprès des acteurs communautaires, les leaders communautaires, pour pouvoir délocaliser la bataille qui est juste à côté de leur école. Et ce problème, par exemple, a été signalé dans les mécanismes de plainte et les initiatives ont été développées par les enfants pour pouvoir délocaliser la bataille en question. Le troisième résultat positif est que les mécanismes de plainte et de feedback adaptés aux enfants constituent un facteur de sûreté, de sécurité et de protection dans les écoles parce qu'ils permettent de limiter les violences à l'égard dans ces écoles, les violences à l'égard des enfants, et que ce soit des violences perpétrées par les pères, que ce soit les violences perpétrées par les, et, et, et les, les enseignants, les enfants arrivent à les exprimer et on arrive à limiter toutes ces violences-là. Les mécanismes de plainte et de feedback aussi, peuvent, à travers ces mécanismes, les enfants peuvent partager de façon sur les informations qui impactent leur communauté. Vous avez vu à travers les différents travaux de groupe, surtout les images qui sont projetées, et les enfants essaient de, de dire d'une manière ou d'une autre les problèmes qui les impactent au niveau de leur communauté. Et à travers ces mécanismes de plainte et de feedback, nous avons aussi la possibilité d'avoir connaissance des problèmes de protection et d'y répondre diligemment, notamment par les feedbacks directs qui sont adressés au niveau des comités de gestion et des, des plaintes. Et c'est une fois que ces plaintes sont adressées de façon directe, une réponse diligente est faite et l'enfant est référé 
trouver une structure de protection pour résoudre son problème le plus rapidement possible. Sur ce, je vous remercie et je vais passer la parole à Seydou pour les défis et les limitations. Merci. Merci, Zoenabou. Et c'est d'où je m'excuse de vous déranger, mais il va falloir qu'on boucle dans la prochaine minute pour passer aux autres intervenants. Merci pour votre compréhension. Merci. Merci bien, Zoenabou. Les défis peuvent se résumer comme suit. Le, le premier défi que nous avons pu euh, identifier, c'est que L'appropriation et la pérennisation des mécanismes dans les écoles, c'est vraiment un grand défi parce que ces mécanismes-là, l'objectif est qu'ils survivent aux écoles, même après le projet FAST. Il y a la réticence de certains acteurs par rapport justement à la composition des comités de feedback et de plaintes. Il y a la synergie entre les différents acteurs pour pouvoir apporter des réponses diligentes et efficaces. Le, le manque ou l'insuffisance d'expertise pour décoder certains feedbacks des élèves, particulièrement le cas des décès. Il y a aussi la question de l'accessibilité des canaux du fait de, fact, de certains facteurs d'ordre individuel. Nous avons aussi le manque d'action sur tous les pays. Le périmètre d'action, justement, le manque de contrôle sur tous sur tout les périmètres d'action par rapport à, à certaines, certaines réponses qui doivent être apportées. Voilà quelques beaucoup, défis et limites que nous avons pu identifier. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Cédou. C'est très, très riche et j'imagine qu'il y a plein de gens qui voudraient faire un suivi et, um, et peut-être si, so sorry, I'll speak in English. If anyone would like to uh, follow up, uh, please do put your email in the chat because uh, Sedou and Zuenabu and Julia would be very happy to hear from you and to share more about their work that they're doing in Burkina Faso. So thank you all for that rich discussion. Um, and without further ado, I would like to pass over to our final group of speakers in today's session. Um, we have with us um, a group from the Elevate Children Funders Group. We have with us Zoe Trout, Sheila Bowler, and Heather Hamilton. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I believe we've got a presentation coming up in just a couple of seconds, but my name is Zoe Trout and I'm with Elevate Children Funders Group. Um, I'm joined today by my colleagues, Heather and Sheila, if they just want to give a little wave. Perfect. And we can go ahead to the next slide. So CFG is a global network of funders, all focused on the well-being and rights of children and youth. We support children and youth by building a community of funders and creating spaces for learning, collaboration, alignment, and action. Over the last few years, we heard a desire from members and their grantee partners to more actively center and shift power to children and young people. But many of our members were left wondering how. Next slide, please. So that's really what we're here to talk about today. We know that child and youth participation, when done right, has the power to catalyze real change. However, we also know that it is a process and often an intimidating one, and the risk of doing it wrong feels big. So last year, we worked with an incredible team of researchers and advisory group of funders and an amazing group of young activists to create a funders toolkit for child and youth participation with practical guidance on all aspects of child and youth participation. So to get started, we just wanted to show you a brief video sharing some key takeaways from that work in their words. And let's go on the next slide. ECFG members and funders more generally have increasingly recognized that child and youth participation is not only a child's right under the Convention on the Rights of the Child and a powerful tool for shifting power to the communities most effective, but it also contributes to their strategic out outcomes, their goals, even for programs that don't appear on the face of them to address children and youth. 
when you engage funders, they frequently just argue that they do not understand the issue or that there is no data or there is no evidence to speak to it or that there is they do not know you know how they how to address the issues now we have the evidence from a philanthropic perspective um, meaningful participation and particularly co-ownership over a process and piece of work not only leads to more impactful grant making programs but it really transforms funders attitudes and practices it's just so interesting how this how we can have girls actually grant money and use money and see that money is a really important tool for independence. That it's so important not to see that purely as a sort of a process that is technical, but really a, a you know a political process that is around sort of sharing and shifting power. Not just uh, you know having them there as um, to tick a box, no, but being intentional from from their planning stage to implementation. So, Children and young people who participate in, in these types of processes are more likely to, to, be, um, uh, to be interested in, in engaging as uh, citizens outside of them. Because at the end of the day, um, we, the youth, who's going to be, you know, the people who are going to inherit this world. Might require some internal reflections, understanding of biases and beliefs even if they're unconscious. I, I would like to see more funding being deliberate and also consistent in actually um, involving young people in their process. One recommendation is for funders to focus more on making youth participation meaningful by actually seeing that the manual is more practical at structural level and at program level. There's various ways that you can um, sort of deepen participation one of them is actually bringing young people into your organizations so hiring um, young people and creating the organizational structures and programs policies and culture that ensures they can actually have influence just direct resourcing of child and youth organizing is kind of almost the ultimate form of participation um so we might as well just you know take a bit of control to ourselves and just um believe in it um, now that we have the evidence what is going to happen. So I'm actually looking forward to that and to also seeing more people use this toolkit as part of their advocacy. Today, we've been challenged by young people to be more intentional and to be more deliberate about what we as funders are doing. And what we hope is that this toolkit can give you a framework to do that with confidence and to allow young people to lead. So as Zoe mentioned, um, one of the reasons that we commissioned this toolkit was because funders didn't have a really good how practical how to conduct this work. Um, we had great interest among our member organizations and others around the idea, and there was a lot of good evidence around how to conduct this work outside of a money moving situation. But when you're in a funding situation, there wasn't a lot out there. So a few notes. I don't want to go into a great deal of detail about the methodology, but I do want to note that this um, toolkit is based on not just a desk review, but a participatory process that included interviews and focus groups with both funders and young people themselves. The toolkit is intended to complement what's already out there. It draws together key existing resources and practice-based learning and builds upon them. We aimed to feature the experience of a wide range of children and youth funders, from women's funds to private foundations to family foundations, covering a wide uh, spectrum of approaches and styles. But one caveat, we know that this toolkit has to be adapted to country contexts and needs and local contexts and needs. It's critical to recognize that the tools and mechanisms that work in one place might need adjustment to achieve similar results in another. Context matters. Next slide. So when we started designing this process, it was really clear that there was a need for a section on making the case, not just the how, but the why for funders on why they should support meaningful child and youth participation. Through the desk review, the survey, and workshops, we found that meaningful participation can be a powerful and invaluable catalyst for change and impact at multiple levels. Not only is it children and young people's right to participate in the decisions that impact their lives, but whether you start big or small, you will see positive impact. At a personal level, it builds confidence, empathy, and self-esteem for young people, from a philanthropic perspective, meaningful participation and co-ownership not only leads to more impactful grant-making programs, 
but it also transforms funders' attitudes and practices, breaks down patriarchal and colonial structures, and shifts power within the broader funding landscape. Something that I found so exciting was the fact that participation leads to stronger movements and um, building room for solidarity by building room for solidarity and coalition building and more democratic societies by encouraging processes like voting and consensus building. There is a making the case section in the toolkit that is downloadable separately from the main document for those of you that want to share something short and snappy with your leadership boards. It includes statistics and quotes that really bring these findings to life. We can go to the next slide. So I'm super excited to share with you this gorgeous new model for youth participation, which we've called the tapestry of participation. This offers you a collective process to weave a shared story together with young people, co-creating something beautiful and meaningful that will last for generations. Each tapestry is unique depending on who comes together to create it. So the research and DAS review surfaced a four-step process for designing participatory approach. So first, establishing grounding principles as the foundation for participatory practice, which we'll talk about in more detail in a moment. Also looking at four levels of participation within an organization. So the organizational or operational, programmatic and grant making, influencing, and monitoring, evaluation, and learning with associated entry points for each one of those areas and participatory mechanisms attached to each. The third part of the model is um, being able to decide which children and young people to work with based on who is in your network. And finally, the model explores the four depths of participation consulting, decision-making, co-designing, and resourcing child and youth-led organization themselves. You can read more about these steps in the toolkit. This model layers all of these on top of the other, tailored to the institution and how they currently are or wish to work with children and young people. Next slide, please. So the research process surfaced 10 key principles, which really serve as the foundation of this model. Those principles are that it be a process, not a one-off project, that there's co-ownership, that it is safe and consistent, that it's inclusive, so centering inclusion from the beginning and working to create those conditions um, for diverse children and young people to participate and lead, that it be intersectional and recognize the diverse and intersecting identities and realities of children and young people, that it be non-extractive and compensated, so we're valuing young people's time, expertise, and contributions, and that we're clear about our intentions and in building on feedback and recognition throughout. That it be experimental and iterative, so building in enough time and flexibility for ongoing learning and adaptation. That it be brave and open, so be ready to have those uncomfortable conversations, take calculated risks, and be open to vulnerability. Um, and holding power to account, recognize children and young people as political actors and embrace the systemic change um, and work that you have to do to do that. And lastly, be intentional and be patient, have a clear plan and build in enough time to do it right. The toolkit features examples of what participation looks like with and without each of these principles. So we encourage you to take a look. And there are also reflection activities for funders to think about as a starting point for developing their approach. Next slide. So in looking at the model, we realized that different organizations will have different entry points for participation. Um, of course, you'll see much more detail and nuance about each of these in the toolkit itself. And ultimately we learn by doing, but overall what we found is that there are four main areas that funders and even others can start to engage children and youth in participation. So the first is around organizational strategy and operations, hiring young people, engaging young people in participatory strategy development, organizational strategy and design, having a youth board members or advisory group. Uh, the second is directly in the grant making area. So through participatory grant making, engaging young people in the program grant making strategy, et cetera. But it's not just in those two areas which are the first to come to mind. We also know that Children and young people can be involved in the influencing work of an organization. It's advocacy and campaigning, it's communications, 
and also in the monitoring, evaluation, and learning and research aspects through uh, input into organizational MEL, uh, and input into research and participate, participatory research. So what we know is that there are many, many different entry points, and these may be more or less challenging depending on the organization. So different ones will work for different organizations, and it's important to look at what would work for your organization best. And of course, some funders will be able to engage in many of these, and some funders might just want to experiment with one or two to begin with. And so this is really kind of a flexible toolkit for you uh, to pick and choose from. Next slide, please. So there's so much more to dig into within the research and within that model, but we wanted to be sure that we had plenty of time for discussion today. So I encourage you to use the QR code or the link on the screen. We can also try and get a link in the chat um, to read the toolkit more closely. But for now, I'm so happy to pass to my colleague, Sheila, to walk us through a brief case study exercise. Thank you, Heather and Zoe, for uh setting us up well to have a, a bit of a deeper dive conversation. Um, we are going to go through, there's, there's a couple of case studies that are included in the toolkit and included in the trainings that we provide as a part of this toolkit. And the one you see on the screen is just, is just one of those. Um, but we want to hear hear from you, uh, turn the conversation over to you. So we're going to talk about this this scenario here. Um, we're interested, you're interested, you and your organization, in testing a participatory research process with children and young people, but you're struggling to get buy-in from your leadership team. They have doubts how beneficial the process will be for the organization, and they also wonder if it's a good use of children's time. Before we go into the case uh, by, by either a raise of hands or uh, sharing a reaction or throwing something in the chat. How many of you have experienced something like this as you're navigating child participation in your work? Okay, we're seeing a few reactions. Some of us, some of us have seen this. We've experienced this. We, we, we know, we know um, that that making the case can be tough. Great. Um, well, we are going to take. We're going to offer just 60 seconds, a minute for you to think about uh, this first question here. So uh, how might you take it to your leadership team or board? Uh, if you if you want to push for a participatory research process, um, thinking about whether you are a funder, an organization or whatnot, but really convincing your team, your leadership team, your board uh, to make investments in this area. I'm going to give you 60 seconds to think about that and then we're going to we're going to hopefully have hear from some of you about your experiences. Just take a moment to jot down any notes, reflect how would you bring this to your leadership team or board? Okay. So someone who has, we I know we have a number of people on this call, we've heard from you today, someone who has engaged in youth participation before in research processes and grant making processes and programmatic processes, what would you do in this scenario? Um, and start, start by introducing yourself. Thanks so much, uh, Camilla, jump in. The floor is yours. Hi there. I would just say that I've been lucky enough to work for organisations that do believe in this, but the challenge has more been the donors. So where I worked for an organisation that sort of self-funded this kind of work, it was fantastic and we did loads of it. But then trying to put in a kind of project based proposal where you need to say what all of the outcomes will be at the very beginning and you don't know because it's a participatory process. This for me is the sticking point. And I've come to feel that all we can really do is keep collating the arguments from other participatory projects of kind of what the outcomes were to be able to then say, look, this is the evidence that it works, trust, trust us. Um, but that's just my experience. Mm, thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, we recognize that as well, that the, the funders have to uh, be on board in order for many organizations to be able to push this forward. And uh, hence, hence why we created uh, the toolkit here and definitely encourage you to dig in a little deeper. 
Um, if I, I would love your help on pronouncing your name correctly, so I don't I don't mess it up. Um, but please take the floor. Go ahead. Uh, uh, I would just um, so I'm fairly new to this, but um, I'm from India. Just to provide a bit of context. And I work with an organization in which we uh, work with kids who are in alternative care and care leavers. So there's quite a lot of uh, people that we work with at a very direct level who, due to a variety of reasons, are very deprived in terms of social and economic development. And they have been so for almost their entire lives. So that creates a very unique set of young people and children to work with, which typically means that the safeguarding policies and procedures for them tend to be really, really strong and intense. And they're abs like, there's absolutely no messing around with those. So uh, when it comes to our projects and programs, we do struggle a little bit with how much we can get um, the young people involved in the planning of the project itself. Because quite often, if it comes down to say a mental health program or something like an employment program in which we're trying to help them find jobs, we, it becomes a question of protection and safeguarding. So how, to what extent can we get them involved and you know, bring up possibly really difficult trauma in their lives, which they've been dealing with. And India being as diverse and complicated as a country as it is, it's very hard to figure out the level of resources available. So for that, I think taking this idea to a leadership team or even the type of evidence that would be most compelling would probably be something that proves in very specific numbers what exactly the benefit to of having child participation might be, but would also provide a bit of a human element to it by including, say, quotes or qualitative interviews. But I think like the example that Camilla just gave about having a previous example of how it's worked and how it's worked really well, but because of the demographic we work with, probably having it specifically from this country, from India or from a similar country or from a similar demographic would probably make the most amount of difference. Because here it's, uh, we, we really can't, you know, because we're responsible for the lives of these kids, we have to really make sure that they're safe. So, yeah. Thank you so much for raising that incredibly important, yeah, safeguarding um, and a, a numerous uh, uh, challenges and opportunities around that really came up in the research and are addressed in the toolkit some and is an ever ever iterating process, um, but we we completely agree with you. Um, the other thing that you noted that um, I think comes out strongly in the toolkit is uh, uh, power bias. Uh, inequities that exist and um, and how much young people were speaking to that being um, one of the most significant barriers to an authentic participation process. So you're absolutely right. Finding the ways to um, have it really be deeply in the community, locally driven, um, contextualized to the to the local environment. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing. Great. Do we, Zoe? I'm looking to you. Do we have time for one more? Um, or should we be wrapping up? Yeah. Okay. Great. Love that. Um, uh, time. Time for another another thought here, particularly for anyone who's struggling. Um, any of us. That... Sorry, maybe just to jump in. We, we it would be wonderful to to wrap up in, in the next couple of minutes, please. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, I um, would love to hear if, if anyone um, does have thoughts on um, particularly the big challenges in bringing this to your leadership or board, please throw that in the in the chat um, or follow up with us. This is something that we are working on closely and um, want to hear from others and, and see how this toolkit can be a resource to you all. Um, so next slide, we'll wrap up here. Um, thanks so much for joining. Sad to be out of time. This is a great conversation. What a great group we have here. Um, if you can scan the QR code on the screen, you'll be brought to a form where you can sign up to be a part of future conversations. Um, we're, we're building out <clears throat> 
learning journeys um, that are specific to this toolkit uh, for both our members and determining what we can be offering to the wider field as well as we really want to get this into as many hands as we can. So please uh, reach out to us and um, let us know if you want to be kept in the loop with what we have coming down the, the pipeline. Um, last reminder, remember this is a process. Uh, everyone's at different stages um, along that way. Uh, the commitment isn't to being perfect, but really to seeing this as a journey, talking to each other and learning from each other and um, keeping children and young people at the center of all we do. So thanks, thanks for joining us. Um, and we appreciate all your time and insights you shared. Thanks for having us. Over, over to you, Kristen. Thank you so much to Sheila, Heather, and Zoe for your fantastic presentation, as has been echoed in the chat. Um, it's really so rich, and they're really, um, unfortunately, in, in the time we wouldn't haven't been able to go in as much depth as we would like to, but it's fantastic that you left us with your contact details and another and a way to continue the conversation. So let's take this as an invitation as them to, to actually do that, to continue the conversation. And the same thing as well. Um, I also heard um, in the, or saw in the chat that both Rashi and uh, Julia Sedu and uh, Zoe Nabu also were keen to continue the conversations with all of the audience members who are interested in, in that continuation. So um, it is now um, my role to uh, bring the session to a close, and I will do that by thanking all of our speakers. Um, so thank you again to Rashi, thank you to Julia, Zoe Nabu, and Sedu. Thanks also to Zoe, Sheila, and Heather um, for bringing so much rich content, so much thought-provoking content to, to this meeting today. Um, it's, um, we, uh, um, we're, we're, we're so pleased to be able to host these sorts of discussions and think together about fulfilling that invitation in the Alliance strategy about thinking about how do we start that child participation revolution in the humanitarian sector. So um, with that, um, I would like to also thank our participants for being so dynamic, so engaged through all of the different interactive segments. We have a final Menti poll. Um, so I'd like to uh, ask our producers to pop that poll into the chat, and we invite you all to fill in that final Menti poll uh, before you log off this session. And then I'll just pass back to Julie, maybe just to wrap us up and tell us what's what's next. What other things can people take a look at if they'd like? Mm -hmm.